Yep. So I know a lot of us can work with um, pre-service teachers or we're working um, with students. I want us to do a little bit more writing to think about um, metaphors and how we can employ some of this within our own teaching. There's this lovely book called Metaphors We Live By. I don't know if anyone's read it before, um, but it's something I really notice, you know, between moving countries, um, having lived and traveled abroad, the metaphors and the idioms that we use really dictate like our cultural experience. And it's often not until I use like some kind of metaphor or some kind of idiom um, that doesn't quite translate from one country to another. And I, I think I'll use it in conference presentation or remember I was talking to a group of Americans about how we wanted to start with a low hanging fruit, which is a very Aussie thing to say. You start with something that's easy, it's easy to grab, um, but it didn't quite translate. Um, but I want to think about if we're working with pre-service teachers, for instance, how we can think about the subject, object, and like the doing something. So metaphors really reflect our understanding of the world and they can be useful for pre-service teachers. And something that I've used this before is at the beginning of a semester and end of the semester, when I'm really trying to challenge their understanding of literacy, of learning, of teaching, of some of literature. And they can then see how the metaphors and the words that they use like, change over that time because it really changes their conceptualization. And so what I'd like you to do is to think about how you might be able to think, whether you use teaching or learning or if there's something else that's really um, um, relevant to the work that you do, like with teachers or with students, to think about how you could create a metaphor that has a subject, there is an object, you know, so, um, like teaching is a butterfly that um, you know uh, emerges from the cocoon, whatever it is, right? But how would you actually describe something that's relevant to the work that you do? And then how can that be useful working with the students and teachers that we're teaching to have them think about their conceptualizations of the world? So take a couple of minutes and write some kind of metaphor, whether you use teaching, whether you use learning, whether you use literacy, or something else entirely. But how could you create a metaphor? So we take another minute.
want to share a metaphor that they created? I started with some low hanging fruit. Sorry? I said I started with some low hanging fruit. <coughs> <laughs> and I, went for I, just, I love that expression, you know, just it makes a lot of sense. A lot of Aussie phrases relate to like food in some way. So. I, I didn't I didn't realize that was a, an Aussie kind of a thing, but I, I um, uh, yeah, learning is a key that opens doors. Lovely. But mm -hmm. and also if you think so, learning is a key that opens doors, like that conceptualization, you know, of learning. You know, it's something that you can possess, mm -hmm. or maybe you don't have, but you can acquire, you mm -hmm. know, but that opens doors. The doors can be even quite physical, you know, it can be quite like um uh, quite uh, like metaphorical as well. But that's it shows a kind of idea of learning and how you conceptualize it, right? Yeah, well I thought it could work for either teaching or learning, but yeah. I chose learning because I like the idea of giving the learner any agency. Yep. Exactly. And that conceptualization too, that the learning is something that you um, like have control over, right? You have responsibility for and you have like agency as well. And so if you're doing this kind of work with pre-service teachers, it shows kind of which like theoretical underpinnings they unconsciously are associating with learning, right? Are they taking a more like sociocultural approach, are they taking a more like behavioral approach? Are they taking an approach that's more you know, didactic? But it gives you an idea about how they're thinking about learning in a way that, you know, we're often quite unconscious because it's how we've, you know, we've picked up things in the world. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else want to share a metaphor that they created? Only, only five solutions. <laughs> What's yours? Mm. Teaching is a gardener who helps flowers bloom in their own way. Teaching is a gardener who Gardener who helps uh, flowers bloom in their own way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, the teacher is a gardener who has to nurture and tend, mm -hmm. you know, and really cultivate. Mm -hmm. So it's a very specific way of then, like looking at like, the role of teachers, right? Because instead of being like the teacher, someone who just like directs, it's like no, it's, there's more of this this cultivation and this care that goes into it. Excellent. Maybe one more. Anyone else want to share? Uh, oh, yeah, it's not lethal, you know, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> We're just playing. Mm. Well, I wasn't, I'm not sure if it works well, but a teach, it, I think it could work for both teaching and learning. Yeah. But teaching is a spark lighting a flame or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. What we do can create um, yeah, interest and energy. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I've done before with this kind of exercise with my students is so I have them over three units over an entire like, calendar year. It will do this sometimes at the beginning and also at the very end so they can kind of revisit how their ideas and the conceptualizations have changed. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's not, you know, having them write like entire poems and even just be using the poetic techniques as a way to kind of reflect their conceptualizations about themselves as, you know, pre-service teachers the idea of like learning and the role that it has um, for young people. Mm -hmm. um, something else we can do too, this will be like the last running activity, I promise. Just, just, um, just, you know, just one second before you move yeah. on. Uh, uh, in this university school, um, we've been working a lot with the writing frames. Yeah. Okay, it's pretty standard, it sort of knocks you down, but it also gets, gets you starting, you yeah. know, started. So I, it really works. I mean, yeah. all the students are able to to produce that much of text five times, you know, yeah. in this essay, yeah. instead of just mm -hmm. thinking about what to write. Yeah. It's really, really, really useful. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Yeah, and I think that that's just, in, but again, with writing, often writing is so high stakes, it can be really intimidating for students, no matter like what their age. Um, and something else you can do too is like subjects and objects. So taking something, um, I mean, ideas are throughout there, like empathy, pedagogy, or literature, write down what it looks like, sounds like, tastes like, smells like, and feels like. So you do like, just kind of like that sensory imagery. We saw this a lot in like Sarah Munster's poem, where she talked about like, the tastes and smells from like this, um, this place. Um, but maybe choose something, a subject or an object, it could be something that's relevant to your work. So it could be professional development, it could be technology, it could be um, like English as a language, it could be writing across a curriculum, right? So choose something and then select at least kind of like three of those different sensory imageries. What does it look like, sound like, taste like, smell like, or feel like? So 
professional learning looks like, it sounds like, it tastes like, right? What would I fill in those blanks with? So take a couple minutes and think about, choose something that's relevant to your work as a professional, and then choose three of the different senses and how you would express that. Even if you just want to share just like one line that you came up with. Um, so this one I was thinking about writing, so I've had a couple of writing projects that I'm, I'm working on. So I said, writing can sound like traffic, where it's disconcerting and frustrating, yet you're comforted by the slow incremental progress. <laughs> Anyone want to share something with they wrote? You seem like the sensory imagery. Well, I just wrote about literature, and I think I mixed, I mixed a bit. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I just said, literature, to me, it looks like bookshelves. Sounds like voices and feels like exploration. Yeah, excellent. Anyone else want to share theirs? 
Outside town. Diversity looks like a meadow of wildflowers, not a rose garden. Mm -hmm. Is it like the gardening ones? <laughs> 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 Summer. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't go for literature because I went for technology. Okay. Um, technology looks like looks like fingers. Technology sounds like clicks. Technology feels like new ideas, and technology tastes like bittersweet oranges. Mm -hmm. So I want to um, just kind of close with some of the uh, one more point after this, but just to have some of these activities written in books. I think that this is something that we can do more as part of our work with pre-service teachers within teacher education, mm -hmm. because a lot of at least I know at the University of City, a lot of my students are having to like write lesson plans. They're having to write. The statements of goals and values and how to analyze text. But I think that doing this kind of creative work with like the subjects, the objects, the metaphors, the poems can yield some more of that critical self-reflection that we really need to have them do before they kind of go off into the world and you know, mentor young people. And the last point I want to make today is about how we can use poetry ourselves as scholars and researchers. And I think it can be something that's useful um, to make sense of our data, but also to disseminate our findings. Um, so something that I did as part of my um, trying to get into Insta Poetry, I actually wrote some poems about data analysis and then shared them. And so like this one that I shared online um, is actually in relation to a conversation with um, Paul. He's actually changed his Instagram handle since this, I've not realized. Um, but I was thinking about, we had this conversation about how to analyze um, data and how he had changed his approach with sharing his poems. He used to be really open, shared heaps of his poems. And then he was saying more recently, he's like, oh, look, you know, he said, you can't entrust your stories to just anyone. It's careless. We talk about how they need to earn the right to hear your truth and to bear witness to your pain. I think of the audacity and vulnerability inherent in storytelling as we offer a piece of ourselves and as we hope with a wild patience that we're met in the space between. And so some of what I took from here, like the wild patience is from like Adrian Rich. Um, some of the other ideas about like entrusting your stories from my conversation with the research participant. But I was like, well, okay, if I'm doing some research on Insta Poetry, how can I actually you know, write a short poem as a way to kind of help make sense of the data? And how might some of the key words that are actually some of the codes that I'm starting to use with my data kind of bubble up through the poetry? And so that's um, one thing that I've done. Something else, I won't play the whole um, um, documentary, but had some funding for UNESCO, and as part of that, um, produced a short 15-minute like, documentary on the Bankstown Poetry Slam. And that's something, as a researcher, I never anticipated being in a role as like, a documentary producer. Um, but we're in the process of submitting it to different film festivals now, because I think that it's a way to make the work that I'm doing spoken word. Because I mean, I can write about it and put journal articles, but one of the reasons why I had so many poems in this presentation is I think that speaks far louder than I can about the people. Um, if we actually want to talk about valuing their voices, their voices need to be heard more than my own as a researcher. So creating a documentary is um, something else that I've done. Um, and then, um, yeah, more recently, in addition to that, um, I just done a project that I've applied for a fellowship from the university to think about playwriting, because there's a tradition, if anyone knows some of Johnny Saldana's work, um, he's done some he's done coding manual qualitative researchers and heaps of other books on um, analyzing qualitative data. But he also has some work on using qualitative data and then producing plays and writing plays with that. So it's something I'm trying to do with my next project. So we'll see if the university agrees we should get funding for it. Um, but I think that we can also use these different creative venues, um, whether we're writing poetry or plays or producing films as a way to share the work that we're doing beyond the ivory tower of the universities. Because I find that it's often problematic if we're only kind of reading and writing you know, what's happening here and not sharing the work that we're doing, you know, whether it's around critical literacy or poetry or technology or literacy you know, with a wider audience. Because otherwise it seems quite inaccessible and removed from you know, the, the population at large. Um, so here's some of the references and I, I can share the, the slides later. This is from some of my work. Um, and also, it's all found like on my website as well at jonesideperwood.com. If you're interested in any of like the articles or the chapters that I've talked about today as well, um, also Twitter's on there. Um, so that's all I have for today. So I'd love any like comments, questions, thoughts um, that you have as well.
Could you could you uh, give me your uh, Instagram account? Yeah, it's just it's Jen Scott Kerwood. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking yeah, for yeah. That yeah. Mm -hmm. So Twitter is at Jen Jen yeah. three, and then um, Instagram is just Jen Scott Kerwood. I see some good photos of my dog on there too. Um, <laughs> I, I now have some dog followers on Instagram because I've posted photos of my dogs. So it really amuses me when like a dog likes my Instagram photo. <laughs> like people's accounts that made for their dogs. <laughs> I've thought about doing that, and Poppy, she's very photogenic, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but now some of those dog accounts follow me on Instagram. Spots like your photo. <laughs> every time. <laughs> <laughs> like a professor can like it or a dog can like it. Like that. It's kind of fun. Cool. I would be curious to hear more uh, about your thoughts about um, social media as a tool for social justice in general. I guess. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, not necessarily through poetry, but through other ways, through discussion, through, because I. Uh, I have seen it be a really positive tool for some people, and I've seen it be a tool of frustration for other people. Yeah. Um, Are you so. with like young people, or just kind of like people in general, or people people in general, and in in communities that aren't homogenous? Say mm -hmm. so. Like an example I'm thinking of is that there's a large community of knitters on Instagram. I was just going to say the rivalry. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 So yeah. That's yeah. Exactly what came to mind. Yeah. 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 So this discussion about racism and inclusion the knitting community broke out primarily on Instagram mm -hmm. in January and it's still ongoing mm -hmm. and uh, because the community of knitters has both very you know young uh, knitters who are on Instagram all the time are very comfortable with social media and also you know knitters ranging on up until their 70s and 80s and they may have Instagram accounts but they feel like they can't follow stories or you know they yeah. just don't understand the platform as well it's not as intuitive for them and they get frustrated by that so it's it's interesting because I think that I see a lot of the value of the discussion happening on Instagram but when people feel shut out of that that's mm -hmm. not a positive thing either so yeah 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 because yeah, my, my initial take is just like anything like it's a tool you yeah. know and you know like all of us in this room are old enough to remember before social media existed you know like that's something that I even tell my university students like, I still remember when like I got my first email address and I couldn't imagine why you'd want to use that every day and now I'm like I mean you can't live without it right um, and so it's a tool that you know can complement or replace some other tools that we might have had before that I mean in years gone by would have been like letters to the editor or zines or something else um, but I think that the conscious use of the tool, you know, by the people who are both adept at it and people who, um, you know, are wanting to, um, you know, to get you know, involved in that. But it's also, I mean, it goes back even like the whole legitimate peripheral participation, right? So you might have some people who are really active on Instagram and they're posting and they're hashtagging and they've got like you know thousands of followers. We might have the other people who just like follow some accounts or they are searching a bit, but like that's still a kind of participation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think then what you're pointing out is just the degree to which the people who may feel a bit like disenfranchised like can get involved in that. And I think then it's just that we just the community to be aware of that and the kinds of like discussions that are that are taking place. But you know, I mean, over the next ten years, we're gonna have so many more tools, you know, and spaces and apps that come out, like we can't even predict what they're going to be. So a lot of the work that we're doing, you know, as teachers, as researchers and parents, you know, it's going to move beyond like this tool or this one incident and thinking about what does it actually come down to, right? And it comes down to communication and collaboration and negotiation and um, this contestation as well. Like what are we going to tolerate as a community and what you know, values do we uphold? Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to kind of move beyond Instagram at any one point. It's about the community and what they agree. And maybe some people are, are going to break off and be part of like a, a different group, which is, you know, again, the agency and the progress that they have. But I think it's just, it's interesting to kind of see it happening, you know, at this point in time. But, um, but yeah, like with anything, it's, and Instagram is something that's interesting too, because we, when my other students did a study about how um, 13 and 14 year old girls use Instagram. And if you, it's, the data showed, because she did a lot of observations and interviews, but like the codes that came down to is like, a lot of the girls wanted to be perceived as being pretty skinny, tan, and rich. Mm -hmm. And those are like the ad, 
Yeah, you know, and especially um, for, for parents and for teachers, you know, thinking about, well, what does it mean when young girls feel they need to portray themselves in this way and have these very sexualized ideas of their body at that age. And, you know, and I grew up like during like the grunge scene, like we weren't, I don't remember being body conscious at all. We wore flannels and things were baggy. And, um, and it's something that, you know, just to be conscious well, like anything else, like it's a tool for self-expression, you know, but can also, um, there would be some repercussions like for that as well. So I think it's just again about kind of like the, the conscious use and the mm -hmm. conversations that you know, parents and teachers have to have like with young people about how are we using it. But even those of us adults, when I'm posting a poem, I'm thinking about the hashtags, I'm thinking about audience. You know, I'm not thinking of like being perceived as being like tan or rich, but I'm thinking about you know being perceived as is this academic enough? You know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know is you know, <coughs> a professor from the University of Pennsylvania. You know, like my photo the other day like what is it you know like yeah right so we're conscious of it but like in different ways yeah um but still relevant to kind of the stage and place that we're at in our lives yeah yeah so it's a long answer i don't know if that no i'd love to talk with you more yeah that's really interesting. yeah any other like thoughts or ideas i think you have to be on social media i think there's mm -hmm. we've let go Mm. because of the data protection and all this and mm. then we left the space for uh, extreme groups mm -hmm. who are uh, willing to use it and they're using mm -hmm. it wisely you know mm -hmm. in, in their um, perspective mm -hmm. so what we have to do is to to get in there and mm -hmm. really really talk about what matters mm -hmm. but what should matter i mean it's, mm -hmm. it's a point yeah. of value of course but i think we have to be present mm -hmm. just leave it don't leave it to to mm -hmm. the kids alone mm -hmm. Uh, and the technology comes and goes. Yeah. Uh, it's the concept that is really, really important, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. I've been fascinated. And it's a fascinating place for learning. I mean, if you create your own personal network, you're connected with all the people who are doing research in your area. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, ju it's just a few clicks away, you know, and then you get an answer. It, mm -hmm. It's incredible. And some of my former students who've now graduated and their teachers, they've got an Instagram account, I think it's like gals.who.read. But you know what? They read heaps of books, and there's several of them that manage the accounts. They're always posting like photos and reviews of the books and what they're doing. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's young adult literature, sometimes it's nonfiction. But like what an incredible way for them to kind of share their own reading practice so their students follow them, they get to see what their teachers are reading. And mm -hmm. um, it's really encouraging for me because sometimes I, I feel like I aspire to read more than I actually read, but I'm like, former students are like reading heaps of books and they're giving me you know the copies once they're done and um but I think we can think about how we can use these things within our own practice and mm -hmm. and I use one of the things with my Instagram being public a lot of my um pre-service teachers are still trying to work out the work-life balance and so I'm like well look you know this is something that you know, you've got to carve out for yourself as a professional and how are you going to do that and mm -hmm. how can you own like these aspects of your identity and mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. If you're looking for a job, they'll, they'll Google you. Yes. So not being present mm. means that either you're in <laughs> been in, you're imprisoned, you know, <laughs> for a while, or you know, there are lots of mm. uh, things that uh, matter. Mm. If you're not present, it's not a very good thing either. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate the invitation. Mm. Thank you so much for coming. Mm. Mm.